So hello, welcome back. We're here on the Edge One podcast with Dr. Steenbarger, who is a psychologist and a trading coach. And we are really happy to reconnect after, I think it's been quite a few years. So good to have you back. And thank you for taking the time today to talk to us. Oh, thank you so much, Rolf. It's good to get together again. So I wanted to get right into, because I have so many things I would like to pick your brain about. It's always so fascinating. And I read on your blog that you're writing a new book which I'm super interested about. And you wrote that it is very important for traders to understand their strength and to use that strength or to use their strength to translate it into trading methods and to leverage those uh, strengths. And how do you know, first of all, where do you have your strengths? How do you find that out? And then in the next step, how do you know which strength should lead to certain specific components in your trading strategy? Yeah, it's, it's a great question or a set of questions, Rolf, uh, because it really gets at the heart of how we develop our talents and skills as traders. Uh, there are a few ways we can identify our strengths. One thing I write about in the new book, which is about positive psychology and uh, trading, is that the successes that we experience in trading are related to successes we've experienced in the past in other areas of life. In other words, if something is a strength, it doesn't suddenly magically show up during trading. It's something that has been there during our lifespan. And it may have shown up in terms of how we approach sports, it may have shown up in our schoolwork, in our studies. It may have shown up in how we relate to people. But what positive psychology tells us is that each of us has distinctive talents, distinctive strengths, distinctive values, and we need to draw upon those to be at our best in trading. So it's not enough to simply work on our discipline and make sure we don't go on tilt. I mean, that's all well and good, but we're not going to achieve distinctive success unless we do something distinctively. And how do we do something distinctively? By drawing upon the best of who we are. So it's about the, the meta skills more. It's not about the exact strategy, but um, finding your meta skills, where you've been good, and then modeling your trading strategy around that. For example, is it long-term? Is it short-term? Is it fast decision-making? Is it swing trading where decisions are slower? Is it more in that kind of direction? Yeah, your, uh, your question is getting at sort of the next layer of our development as traders. We start with our, our, our talents, our strengths, but then we have to figure out how do those best align with markets that we might trade? And we can't know that unless we try out different markets and different trading styles. I may have strengths as an athlete. I may have athletic talents. But how do I know if I'm going to be good at one sport or another sport? I have to try. I have to play different sports and I'll figure out which ones I really have a feel for, which ones I have a passion for, which ones I'm good at. What happens with so many beginning traders is that they are so eager to make money that they just jump in and try a particular market and a particular trading style. And the odds are pretty good that it won't fit who they are, what their strengths are. It really takes a while of exploration to figure out what we're good at and what speaks to us. So for example, uh, I teach in a medical school in Syracuse, New York, and the medical students go through what are called rotations where they try out different clinical specialties. They'll spend six weeks doing psychiatry. 
and they'll spend 12 weeks doing internal medicine, and they'll spend six weeks doing surgery. And they go through all of these rotations to figure out what kind of doctor they want to become. And when they see a, a, a lining up of their interests, their values, their strengths with a particular area of medicine, that's what they specialize in in their next phase of education. Traders need to do something similar. So it's like trying out swing trading, maybe day trading, futures, stocks, short term, long term. And I guess that's where you're going with that. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and uh, different markets are very different. Different uh, trading tra strategies are very different. Um, when I started in Chicago uh, working with traders, the average holding time of positions was about six minutes. And I was surprised that most of the traders did not actively look at charts. They were busy looking at the order book and, and the, the bids and the offers coming into the order book. They were really, really, really good at very fast decision making. That was a core talent that they had. That's so different from the hedge fund portfolio managers I work with who will hold positions for weeks and months and analyze different opportunities in terms of macroeconomics and make big picture decisions. Until we try different ways of making decisions, different ways of managing risk, we can't really know what we're particularly good at. Right. I remember so distinctively the last time we spoke, it's been years ago, I don't know how many, but you said the number one uh, skill or trait of any trader is curiosity. And I think this ties in here really nicely as well, that you're just open to exploring new ideas. But I always wonder, and I kept thinking about this when you said it, where, because there's a fine line be between being curious and trying many new things out and this, uh, what we refer to as system hopping, where you're just jumping from one thing to the next. So my assumption is that you need some structured approach to give yourself this, I don't know, six months where every six weeks or eight weeks, you try something new out, you, you record or you pay very close attention to how it's going for you, how you feel about it. How would you recommend that traders who are going to approach it like that go about it? You raise a very good point, and that's what happens in medical school, right? There's a structure for trying different things. So you try it for six weeks, and then the next thing for six weeks. And I think it would make sense to do that with respect to trading different styles, trading different markets. If something is really a fit with who you are and what you do, you'll recognize it in a period of, of weeks. But I want to get back to what you said. Uh, either you have a very good memory, Rolf, or you take very good notes, one or the other. In our last conversation, we talked about intellectual curiosity being really important to the success of uh, portfolio managers. And what you're pointing out is that it's not just curiosity about markets and how they trade. It's curiosity about ourselves. What makes us tick? What am I really good at? Showing that psychological curiosity, that curiosity about ourselves uh, is very important to exploring different types of trading and figuring out where our particular edge might come from. Right. And I guess this ties in a lot. If I, if I can, I'll give an example with my own trading. And I, I don't pretend to be a market wizard here, okay? So uh, take, take what I say with some grains of salt. But uh, in my own trading, I try different styles. And what I found works really well is in equity markets. And I could observe the very short-term buying and selling activities of stocks. I could see when transactions were lifting offers or hitting bids. I could also see how many stocks are trading on upticks versus downticks. That's the NYSE tick measure. And I could see that moment to moment to moment to moment. And so I would watch and watch and watch and, and listen for what the market is doing. And are the buyers getting stronger? Are the sellers getting stronger? And I would be able to make decisions on that basis. 
That's exactly what I do as a psychologist. I sit with a person, I stay quiet, I listen to them, listen to them, listen to them, and eventually I figure out what's going on in their lives and then I respond. So it th that is who I am. And the success that I experience as a trader is very much related to success that I've experienced in other areas because it's all based on a, a certain interpersonal strength. Yeah, that makes sense a lot. And I'm wondering, how do you think is the best approach for the traders who go about those periods where they try new things? Uh, should they record keep? What should they track in their journal? Are there specific things that they should listen to, how they feel? or Because I guess it's not about the P&L, because the P&L in the beginning, when you're just trying new things, it's not going to be great. So they have to listen to or be, pay attention to other impulses or feelings, I guess. Yes. A and when you're exploring different markets and different styles of trading, you really shouldn't be putting anything significant at risk in the markets. So I'm a big fan of trading in simulation mode, of trading the live market, but uh, paper trading it, and then keeping track of P&L, keeping track of your experience, and uh, keeping a journal of that, where you review your performance at the end of the day. What did you do well? What could you do better? And then try to make improvements the next day. You'll quickly learn if this area of the market, this type of trading, is something that fits with who you are. Right. And... In the preparation for the podcast, I read your blog quite a bit again, and you talk a lot about self-awareness. And here, self-awareness, I guess, plays such a huge role. And how do you get to a, a place where you are being more self-aware? I think it's something that today it's going to be harder and harder for people because they are often maybe disconnected, if that's the right word, because they're always on their phone, they're always distracted, and they've unlearned to pay attention to what is going on or how they are or they're paying attention to their emotions. So what are good ways to start being more self-aware and are there techniques that they can use? Yeah. Um, again, a good question. Uh, I think the issue is not just to become self-aware with respect to our emotions, but self-aware with respect to what we are thinking and, and how our thoughts are evolving about the market that we're trading. Uh, one practice that I talk about in the book that I'm writing uh, that I use in my own trading is while the market is moving and while I'm following it, I talk aloud just to myself. Fortunately, I'm by myself, so no one thinks I'm insane. I guess some people do. <laughs> uh, so I'm talking aloud, but I'm talking about, I'm not talking about PL and I'm not talking about what I want to do. I'm talking aloud what the market is doing, what I'm seeing in the market, and my thoughts about that. The way I might talk, let's say I was a sports announcer and, and there's a sporting event going on, and, and I'm the announcer and I'm telling the public, you know, what's going on in the game. Uh, I'm I'm replaying what's going on, uh, filtering it through my own thoughts. It's a way of being self-aware because I hear myself talk, I'm actively processing, and at some point I'll notice something's changed in the market and I'll talk out loud what that means and what I might want to do about that. In a sense, that allows me to mentor myself. In a sense, I'm guiding myself when I do that. Right. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. But I guess in the end, we are always talking to ourselves at some point or pretty much all day, but it's quietly in our head and it's often subconscious and we're just repeating everything. So when you talk out loud, you're bringing way more awareness to it and you're, bringing, you're putting it out there in the world so that you can really bring it to the conscious, uh, I guess, to see patterns, maybe find negative patterns, or just pay more attention to what is actually what you are going to say. 
Yes. Uh, when when we talk just inside our heads, many times it's more reactive and we're easily distracted. Right. Let's say that I was teaching someone how to trade. I would talk out loud what's going on in the market the way I talk out loud when I trade because I'm not focusing on other things. I'm not focusing on PL. I'm not focusing on whether I'm going to get stopped out. You know, I'm talking out loud to connect with this market the same way that I would connect with a person that I meet with in counseling. So it's a different kind of talk, but you're right. It involves much more self-awareness. It's much less reactive. Right. And you can break the cycle of this repetitive, often not very helpful talk that we have in our heads when you bring it out and you stop yourself from just repeating the same stuff over and over again and focus on something that is actually going on outside of you. Yes, yes. Because if I started talking emotionally and reactively, if I start talking out loud that way, I would immediately hear that I'm an idiot. <laughs> like, I would say, what? What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, it, well, imagine being uh, in a, a trading office and the person next to you is talking out loud in a very emotional, reactive way. Yeah. What would you say to them? ST, yeah, <laughs> you, know, you, you, you know, you tell them to be quiet. Um, yeah, because obviously that's not helpful. Um, so yes, you're training yourself to be more structured, more reflective, uh, and to use your word, which I think is good, more self-aware. I want to dwell on this um, self-talk, kind of going to that direction on Edgeron. What I do is often our users can send us their journal and then I go through it to give, you, give them some ideas of uh, how to interpret the data. And in Edgeron, we have this part where you can write like a written diary. And very often I see that traders have a lot of um, like negative self-talk, I would say this. They're very hard on themselves. I just did this on, on yesterday, Monday. And this really stuck with me. This trader had, was very, very hard on himself using a lot of swear words and blaming himself. And is there a place for venting? Is it really destructive? How should they go about this note taking? Yeah, yeah. And you're absolutely right. And actually, you guys are the experts about journals and note taking. Um, but um, the venting is very not helpful. You know, again, let's say that we're working together as part of a trading team. And let's say I make a mistake and you start venting at me. I mean, is that really helpful? Or let's say you're a parent and you have a child and the child makes a mistake and you start venting at the child. Really? Is that going to help their development? So the venting is understandable, but it doesn't have a useful purpose of improving ourselves. We can't always have positive self-talk because sometimes we don't do things positively, but we always want to have constructive self-talk. So if I make a mistake, I want to learn from it and try to coach myself. What could I do better next time? What mistake did I make? How could I improve that? That's constructive uh, self-talk. In keeping a journal, we want to be able to write down not only what we did wrong that we want to improve, but we want to write down what we did right. What did we do well? What good decisions did I make? I made some money today. How did I do that? We want to learn from our strengths, not just our weaknesses. That's a big theme in positive psychology. So if I am making money and making money and making money day after day after day. Maybe that's not random. Maybe I'm doing something well. If I can identify that in my journal and do more of that, then I'll get better and better and better. 
I want when to it comes to right quickly chime in here. Yeah, sure. Okay. Is, yeah. Is, is my connection okay now? Yep. Should be yeah, I think you're better. Great, fantastic. So when we talk about this, uh, these uh, people that venting, uh, obviously there there are a lot of emotions behind um, that that venting. So in your work with traders, uh, have you seen any correlation between traders that are very uh, high and low on the oscillator of say they have a great win, they really celebrate it, they have a big loss, they are really down in the dumps, or those traders that are just have these small fluctuations day by day that don't really celebrate their wins, but also don't get too beat up about their losses. What would you say? Is there any observation here? Yeah, good question. Uh, and that was part of the research that I've been part of in researching what makes traders successful. And what we found is that there are two types of traders. One type of trader achieves good risk adjusted returns. So they would have a high sharp ratio. They don't have a lot of big swings. They have a pretty consistent positive uh, curve to their returns. Another type of trader really is competitive. They love making money. They size positions up and they make money and then they lose money and they make money. And they tend to achieve, when they're right, high absolute returns, not just good risk-adjusted returns. There's a personality trait called emotional balance. In the old days, it used to be called neuroticism. And what that means is how emotionally reactive we are. And people are different. And based on who we are, that will play a role in how we take risk. So some traders are more inclined to volatility of their P&L, and others are more inclined to stability of P&L. The important thing is that we know who we are. So for instance, I'm quite high in that emotional balance. I don't like any drama in my p &L. and And so I size positions and manage risk to make sure that there won't be any huge ups and huge downs that would be disruptive for me. So that ties directly in with what you said at the beginning, that we just have to find that approach that really fits us. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. For someone who achieves those big absolute returns and takes the big bets, the way I trade uh, would be boring. Got it. You know, make a little Got money, make a little you. money, make a little money, make a little money. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. And so we're all wired differently. And we're going to succeed if we can use our wiring to trade well. I see a lot of traders who keep repeating the same mistakes. So this trader, again, I did the review yesterday. He knows exactly what he's doing wrong. He knows that he should stop it. He's writing it time and again, but he doesn't do it. He just keeps doing it. He comes back Monday morning, does the same thing again. How do you break this cycle? And what would you say to traders that are just cannot break out of this uh, this negative cycle where they just keep doing what they know they shouldn't be doing. Yeah. Um, so they're using their journaling to observe what they're doing and what they're doing wrong. That's great, those observations. But that's not enough. We need to turn the observations into goals. In other words, okay, I made this mistake today in trading. My goal for tomorrow is to not make that mistake and to trade that situation differently. But I need something more than the goal. I need a plan. So we're going from observations to goals to plans. What is my plan for improving that? How am I going to trade differently. So for instance, it's a low volume, low volatility market. And I made the mistake of chasing a move, thinking that it's going to trend and thinking that there's going to be a lot of volatility. 
Uh, but when the VIX is low and there's not much volume, that's unlikely to happen. So my goal is to not chase moves. And my plan is to only enter a long position if we're short-term oversold, only enter a short position if we're short-term overbought. And that way I'm not uh, chasing things. And that's my plan. And my goal for the next day is to put that plan into action. Let's see how that goes. Learn from that. Write that up the next day. But if I don't turn my observations into goals and plans, I'm, I'm really not specific enough to make changes in what I do. Right. And after you reach a goal, is there a place for a reward? Or does that help maybe to reinforce that you stick to your new um, habits that you want to that you want to build. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you asked that. There, there are a couple of traders I'm thinking of who will uh, include their partners at home in their trading by saying, "If I reach a certain goal, if I do things well, let's go out to eat at the end of the week, or let's." you know, do something fun together. Uh, but they're creating a goal that's meaningful to them. They're, they're creating, I'm sorry, a reward that's meaningful to them as an incentive. Uh, and, that, and that can work very well for people. Yeah, I've, I've, heard, I've heard also a few traders who talk about the yeah. reward and then the punishment on the other hand, if they don't follow through. But I guess then the role of, um, and you work a lot of trading groups as I, as far as I know, how's the, the role of a accountability partner? Does that help a lot with your overall development as a trader? Yes. Yes. Um, you know, it, one change that has been evident to me in the years that I've been working with traders is that much more trading occurs in teams. And that's true at proprietary trading firms where I work, um, like SMB. Uh, you might be familiar with them. And it's true at the hedge funds also. And, and what happens is when you trade with a partner, when you trade with a team, you automatically include a level of accountability. And it's not only accountability about results, it's accountability in terms of your ideas. So team members or, or pairs will get together before the opening of the market and they'll share their research, they'll share their ideas. So they're accountable for their preparation, not only for their P&L. Uh, that brings an extra level of discipline. It also brings an extra level of motivation because some of us are interpersonally motivated. And so I might do for my team or I might do for my trading partner what I would otherwise not do just for myself because of that social motivation. Right, yeah. I've heard it a lot when talking to friends during this uh, home office era now that when they're working from home, they are doing their work differently. Of course, you might have a little bit more time because the going back and forth to the work is not there, but when nobody's looking over your shoulder and you don't have the colleagues to talk to during the day to talk about where you are, what is going on, and to showcase your work, they do things differently. And I guess this applies to traders who mostly actually are trading on their own and then they don't have any way or they don't have anyone that they're reporting to. They can do whatever they want. They don't have to do the work because in the end, nobody really cares. So it makes a lot of sense to find someone that you can team up together even if you don't have access to a, a group. It's, it's a great point. And, and you notice there are a number of um, uh, virtual or online trading communities that have sprung up. And I think that's exactly why traders get involved with those communities is to have people that they can interact with and, and include that level of accountability. Right, yeah. I want to talk about something different. Um, because I'm really interested, I, I think you you wrote it, or I think Moritz, we talked about it. How do you find energy and motivation in your trading when your P&L isn't where you want it to be? Let's assume you have, you're past this six or eight month period where you've tried out different things, then you've settled on something and now it's about becoming better, 
and you have some experience. But when when it's not going well, how do you pick yourself up and how do you keep motivated? Yes, it's a, a, a common dilemma for traders. Um, two responses to that. One gets back to that intellectual curiosity. In other words, if I love researching markets, generating ideas, uh, figuring things out, that keeps me motivated. That keeps me involved in trading. And the PL might be good, the PL might not be good, but I'm not trading with PL as my only source of motivation. That curiosity keeps me involved, even during the times of drawdown. So that's the first thing. The second thing is something I've emphasized for a long time, and that is to always have in your life something more important to you than trading and P&L. So I have a, a wife of 40 years plus, I have kids and grandkids. If you were to see to my immediate right, there are two rescue cats that are sitting on my table and uh, they keep me company. But there are things in life that you know keep us positive, keep us involved, keep us motivated. And so when trading doesn't go well, there are are other things that we feel good about. Sometimes traders think when they begin trading that it has to be their passion and that's all they're interested in. They're going to work and work and only focus on trading. All their eggs are in one basket. They're not diversified. And so that makes them very vulnerable when the PL is not there. What you want is for your life to be a diversified portfolio. Lots of different things giving unique positive returns. And if one thing doesn't work out for a while, uh, it's not something that will throw you emotionally. Right. Do you think it's different for young traders who don't have this life built for them yet, who are just starting out maybe out of college, university, and they think that trading is their one pathway to a better life and then naturally they will pull all their resources and time into it or it's still applicable that you should spread your interests and have hobbies and definitely spread interest you know i think back to when i was in college and i was very into basketball i was very into my friendships and relationships uh, i had spiritual interests yeah, I, I think that you can be young and still have a breadth of interest. When when people say that trading is going to be their one path to success, that doesn't sound like motivation to me. That sounds like desperation. If I feel that I'm a successful human being in general, I may experience that success in markets, and if I can't express express it in markets, I'll find other ways of being successful. If when people are too focused on trading and this is their one path of success, that worries me. That sounds like a, a desperate situation. Right, it's too much pressure as well. And I think what you yes. said in the beginning, the you give yourself time six weeks per strategy or per field. You can apply to the broader spectrum. Give yourself six months for trading, and then you try another business or whatever interest you have so you can broaden this approach as well to other areas. That's right. And, and you may find uh, an interest in markets that's different from actual trading interests. And so I have people I work with who work at hedge funds as analysts and they do statistical analysis, they build models, they develop they do research, they develop ideas, uh, but they're not primarily involved in taking risk themselves. And for them, that's a fulfilling career in markets. Yeah, makes total sense. How do you make your emotions an ally 
and not treating it as an enemy. I think more it's that question when we talked about the podcast before came to you from you. And I think it's so, uh, I'm so curious about this as well. We hear this phrase in trading a lot that you should trade like a robot and you should come to your desk emotionless, but how do you, is that the right approach or how do you, how do you go about using treating emotions in trading? Again, I use an analogy in medicine. When the medical student studies the human body and the medical student does a rotation in a medical specialty like surgery and observes how surgeons do their work and participates in a in, in a uh, helping way with the procedures and then they become residents and they start participating in the surgery and they learn how to do it step by step and there are procedures for it but they're practicing and practicing and practicing and eventually they do the surgery themselves but by that time they've observed so many surgeries and participated in so many surgeries that it's familiar to them why don't surgeons go on tilt the risk reward is a lot greater than with markets. But can you imagine your surgeon on tilt? Well, I hope not. <laughs> but the point here is that this, they're not like superhuman people who don't have emotions. It's that their training process has guided them and made the risk taking has made the risky activity so familiar that they are problem focused, not emotion focused. And that's true in other fields as well, that the right learning process and development process takes the big emotion out of what we do. So many times the problem of tilt, the problem of emotional trading is really the result of an issue, not the issue itself, that traders are too eager to jump in and do risk, uh, take risk. They're too eager to jump in and trade without going through the learning process that would help them adapt to the normal ups and downs of markets. All right. Yeah. So I work in hedge funds and I meet with teams and for instance, they'll set up a whole day with me to, for me to meet with different traders and, and, and uh, team members and, and portfolio managers. Typically during a given week, the percentage of traders at these hedge funds who talk to me about emotional trading and tilt and things like that, zero. No one talks about that as an issue or a problem. We talk about other things and other challenges in trading, but they have trained in the right way so that that, and they have gained experience. So that's not an issue for them. Yeah, that's interesting. I think I read the book, the book is called Checklist Manifesto and they bring up surgeons as well, I think. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool yeah. Gawandi. And uh, yes, and that's a great example. When you create rules of performance, a checklist, do this, do this, do this, do this. It makes everything rule-based. It makes everything process-based. And so uh, it's, it's easier to act in a way that takes out the emotion. Yeah, and I guess trading is also very... Uh, a, a very good field for that because many things you can put into a checklist format. Of course, there's some subjectivity in some areas, but many things I think you can standardize and then you can see right away where you deviated from your plan. That's absolutely true. And, and what Gawande was talking about is creating quote unquote best practices. And so, and use in medicine, they use research, outcome research to determine what are the best practices for the various uh, things that we do as a physician. Here, as a trader, you're looking at your successes 
and identifying your best practices. But then once you identify what you do well, you turn that into a checklist. You make that more observable, more automatic. One thing that I see in Edgewonk a lot, traders journal their emotions and their mental states. I often have a feeling that this might not be optimal because when you journal your trades, it's usually after the fact. And then you might be more likely to associate a negative emotion with a losing trade. I was I was wondering if you have some ideas or suggestions. What would be good, not mental aspects, but mental, but going into that direction, things that traders could track in their journal to help them bring more connect or find more connections to their results. Is there something that comes to your mind? Yes. Um, this is something I in the online uh, blog book that I wrote, Radical Renewal. So there's a book that I wrote, and each uh, chapter is a blog post. And it's on my uh, trader feed uh, site, blog site. And one of the things I mentioned is that psychologically, a powerful emotion that we have is gratitude. When we feel grateful for something. When we make a mistake in trading, that's a potential learning experience. That's an opportunity to get better. We can actually feel grateful. We can feel gratitude for our mistakes because our mistakes can define our opportunities. So that's a whole different mindset. I'm here not to make money every day because that's not possible or realistic, but I'm here to learn every day. I'm here to get better every day. And so how am I going to use my mistakes to get better? Having that as an orientation to the journaling, I think can be very, very, very helpful. I'm a huge like fan that. of radical renewal. I have that oh, uh, printed you. out on, uh, I reread it periodically. It's uh, really, really great for me as well. Oh, well, thank you very much. Yeah, I wrote that because I felt there was a real relationship between spirituality and trading. You know, yes. we talk about trading psychology, and that's great. But there are things that we do and ways we develop ourselves spiritually that can make us better as traders. Absolutely, yes. Which is not an obvious connection at first, but once you delve exactly. deeper into the topic, it becomes quite apparent. <laughs> yes, it's not obvious at all. In fact, many people think that trading is just about making money and being materialistic and all of that. Uh, when in fact, uh, to develop ourselves as traders, we have to develop ourselves as people. And that gets into spiritual development as well as psychological development. Mm -hmm. Um how would you so to talk about self-development how would you help a trader that puts a lot of pressure on themselves by having unrealistic expectations um i see that quite often uh, with traders that we work with that they want to make x percent per year they want to take x trades per day uh, they want to be making so and so many hours per month, etc. So basically, they are not process oriented; they are goals oriented, and those goals are so far out there that it would make them the next market wizard. <laughs> and uh, how 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 do you get patience into these traders or realistic expectations? Yeah. Yeah. So the general term that we use in psychology for this is perfectionism. And we can use perfectionism to become self-critical. So good enough is not good enough. I improved my trading, but I still made this mistake and this mistake. I should make this amount of money. And so what we do is a form of cognitive work or cognitive therapy where we keep a journal of our thinking. We're training ourselves to think about our thinking. And typically in a cognitive journal, there will be several categories. The first one is, well, it's ABCD, the activating event. What event has set us off? 
B, what is our belief about that event? What are we telling ourselves? What's our self-talk? That's the perfectionistic expectation. C, what are the consequences of that perfectionistic belief? How is it making us feel? How is it making us act? And D stands for disputation, disputing, challenging the negative belief. So what's a different way of thinking that allows me to approach improvement in a non-perfectionistic way? And so literally we keep a thought journal, A, B, C, D, and we train ourselves to intercept our negative thinking and replace it with more constructive thinking. So we may make mistakes, but we're going to process those as the opportunities to learn rather than ways of getting down on ourselves. That is really helpful. Thank you. I will, uh, I will try to apply that firstly to myself and then to our students, see how it goes. Yes, and, and and you know that's an important use of the the journals that that you have people keep is that it, they can not only track their trading but they can track their thinking about their trading and train themselves to think in more constructive ways. Mm -hmm. That's the quality qualitative part of the journal then, which is super important as well. Right. Right. Yeah. They're journaling about the market and the trading, but they're also journaling about themselves. So thank you so much. We are, I want to be mindful of your time. I know you have another appointment. So thank you. I want to thank you so much for being on here. It was a very great conversation. I really enjoyed it. Lots of things to, to ponder. So I will put all the links um, to your radical nuance, to your uh, trader feed, to your Twitter, into the video right. and the podcast description so people can check it out. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you also, Morris, yes, for being thank you. here today. Great, great. And, and when you post this, definitely let me know so I can help get the word out. Uh, but you're asking really, really good questions. It's obvious that you work a lot with traders who are journaling and who are learning from their experience. Um, and hopefully this gives them some ideas about how they can advance themselves. I'm sure it will. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity.